peace be with you. Friends, always a joy to be with you. Welcome to worship for this third Sunday in Lent. Our readings this morning capture two events that live vividly in the biblical imagination. These are the Ten Commandments given by God to Moses on Mount Sinai, and Jesus cleansing the temple in Jerusalem. And I'm going to talk to you a bit about how these readings intersect and how they apply to our lives today. Our first reading from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 1 to 17. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, my friends, during this time, a lot of us have been doing some catching up with old favorite TV shows, and I've been doing a bit of that with my wife at home. One of our very favorite TV shows is called The West Wing. I'm sure many of you have seen it. A drama about fictional American president Josiah Bartlett, played by Martin Sheen, and the senior staff of the White House. In the 13th episode of the first season, titled Take Out the Trash Day, 
two of the senior staff, Toby and Sam, are having a conversation. Sam informs Toby that there is a town in Alabama that wants to abolish all laws except for the Ten Commandments. Sam says, they're going to have a problem. And Toby replies, because the Constitution prohibits religious activity in any form connected to government? Good point, Sam says. Two problems. Toby says grumpily, Sam, I'm busy here. And Sam replies, I just mean that some of those commandments are pretty hard to enforce. Coveting thy neighbor's wife, for example. How are you going to enforce that one? Just then, Leo, the venerable White House Chief of Staff, enters the room and Sam says, Leo, did you know that there's a town in Alabama that wants to... Yes, Leo interrupts. What do you think? Sam asks. Coveting thy neighbor's wife's going to cause some problems, Leo says. Sam replies, that's what I said. Plus, if I were arrested for coveting my neighbor's wife, I'd probably bear false witness. It's a very funny scene. And like anything we find funny, it's funny because it's true to life. Several years ago, a state judge in Alabama raised the hackles of civil liberties advocates when he used state funds to erect a large stone with the Ten Commandments inscribed on it outside his courthouse. It increased that judge's profile in the state so much that he became the Republican Party's nominee for a senatorial election a few years later, even receiving the endorsement of the former occupant of the Oval Office. You might remember that story. The judge lost the election to his challenger after several credible allegations were made about past lascivious behavior on his part. But leaving all that aside, there was something wrong with that judge's reasoning if he was entertaining any thoughts that the Ten Commandments are something like the laws of the great state of Alabama. Just as there's something wrong with the reasoning in the fictional scenario that the Ten Commandments would be a perfectly adequate substitute for every law on the books. Now, some have argued that the Ten Commandments form the basis of Western legal systems, and I think that's fair, but only to a point. Certainly the morality of the Bible has had a major influence on what people, and not just Christians and Jews, consider to be right and wrong. We need to give that argument its due. But the laws of every Western society I can think of are hardly carbon copies of the Ten Commandments. In fact, the laws of every Western society I can think of ensure that you're allowed to worship whatever god or gods you like, or not, and do as much work on Sunday as you can handle. You're not going to be arrested for being rude to your mom and dad, nor for stepping out on your spouse, or wishing it was you driving the Maserati and not your neighbor. By my reckoning, anyway, that's five out of ten commandments that our legal books leave out altogether. But really, the reason that the Ten Commandments aren't the same as the Canadian Criminal Code, for instance, isn't just that the latter is much longer and much more specific, but that they're designed for different purposes. You see, there is a difference in kind between the Ten Commandments and the laws of the land. Throughout our Lenten lectionary, Readings are appointed from the Old Testament dealing with God's covenants with ancient Israel, with God's chosen people. On the first Sunday in Lent, we heard about God's covenant with Noah, indeed with the whole of creation, that never again would God destroy the earth by flood. Last week, the Old Testament lesson was about God's covenant with Abraham, that he would be the father of a great nation, that despite his old age, his descendants would be innumerable. Today, we hear the Ten Commandments, which are also covenant promises made by God. Now, every time that God makes a covenant with his people, it is an act of God's gracious love reaching down to touch the lives of his people. And what does God desire for his people? He desires them to have abundance. Not abundance in the sense of material possessions necessarily, but abundance of life. God wishes for his people to live in the light of his presence and to walk with holiness 
and righteousness all their days. To Noah, he promises peace. To Abraham, he promises plenty and, pro and posterity. To Moses and the Israelites, he promises righteousness if they will follow the instructions for abundant life that he has provided in the Ten Commandments. If they remember these commandments and live by them, then they will honor God by enjoying abundant life. Do you see? That's quite different from saying don't do X, Y, or Z unless you want to spend the next five or 10 or 20 years in the slammer. There's a difference in kind between the Ten Commandments and the laws of the land. Following the commandments of God is an invitation to a better life, a better way of living, an abundant way of living that honors God's desire to see his people thrive and flourish. God is faithful to us. And so he gives us this pattern for holy living. It's not punitive, quite the opposite. It's a measure of God's gracious love. Let's talk about the gospel reading for this morning for a moment. In this reading, we find Jesus cleansing the temple in dramatic fashion, Jesus drives the money changers and the merchants out of the temple. Have you ever seen those bracelets and t-shirts and bumper stickers that say, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Well, I once heard someone say, when somebody asks me, what would Jesus do? I always want to point them to John chapter 2 and say, well, remember, if you're asking what Jesus would do, that flipping over tables and whipping people is one of the options. Now, unlike the synoptic gospels, all of the gospels have this episode in them, but unlike the synoptics, that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that have this episode near the end, shortly before Jesus' crucifixion, John's gospel puts it right up front in the second chapter. In a way, Jesus driving out the merchants and money changers sets the tone for the rest of the gospel. It's Jesus' purpose to call God's people back to holy living, back to righteousness, back to abundant life, and forward into still more abundant living under the new covenant sealed in his blood. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up, Jesus said. His fellow Jews replied, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? Here, John gives us a helpful explanatory note. But Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. Jesus is the new temple of God. Jesus is the one to whom the world will turn to worship God in spirit and in truth. Jesus himself is where humanity and divinity perfectly intersect. Jesus' body will be destroyed, but he will be raised up on the third day. This reframes the whole way that Christians think of the temple. But there's still another way that the New Testament reframes thinking about the temple. St. Paul, in his first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. You are God's temple and God's temple is holy. Do you see the connection between these two readings now? God has given us instruction in what makes for a holy life. It is God's desire that we have life in abundance. God has made a covenant promise to us that if we follow his commandments, we will be able to enjoy that kind of living. It's not punitive. It's a covenant made out of God's gracious love and care for his people. It's an invitation to righteousness and peace. But like Jesus, we are called to drive out of the temple 
the temple of ourselves, the temple that we are, all of those things that mar and obscure God's plan for abundant living. We are to stop at nothing to drive out all of those parts of ourselves that get in the way of keeping to God's commandments. Take out the whip, flip over the tables, drive out everything that gets in the way of holy living because that's what Jesus would have you do. And why? Because we are God's temple. Because we are holy. Because God delights in us and wishes to see us live and grow in the light of God's love and to walk blameless before him all the days of our lives, to grow up into the full stature of Christ. The Ten Commandments live vividly in the biblical imagination. But we don't always get them right. They're not a set of rules to be followed as if they were the law of the land. They are to be followed because they make for our own happiness, our own prospering, our own abundance, our own holiness. And that we would be happy that we would prosper and live abundantly, that we would be holy is God's loving will for each and every one of us. And God bless you. Amen. Now, my friends, with confidence and trust, let us pray to the Lord saying, Lord, have mercy. For the one holy Catholic and apostolic church throughout the world, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the mission of the church, that in faithful witness it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those preparing for baptism and for their teachers and sponsors, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For peace in the world, that a spirit of respect and reconciliation may grow among nations and peoples, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor, the persecuted, the sick, and all who suffer, for refugees, prisoners, and all in danger, that they may be relieved and protected, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all whom we have injured or offended, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For grace to amend our lives and to further the reign of God, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. Father of mercy, alone we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. When we are discouraged by our weakness, strengthen us to follow Christ, our pattern and our hope, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now, friends, with confidence and trust, let us pray as our Savior Christ has taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may the God of mercy transform you by his grace and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you this day and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>